is Alco, a perfect volcanic cone. I've hiked for an hour and a half to reach the rim of the crater. I'm around 1,900 metres up, astride Azalco Volcano. Santa Ana is behind me. I'm in El Salvador, a country with over 100 volcanoes. Volcanic activity gave rise to Cuatapeque. Minerals seeping into the lake turned the water turquoise. San Miguel Volcano has been in an active phase since 2013, throwing out clouds of ash and gas. Izalco last erupted in 1966. It's still active today. <laughs> this is a nice warm spot. I'm surrounded by steaming fumaroles. Fumaroles, crevices that emit steam, show there's molten magma close to the surface. In this film, I'll be exploring lavish landscapes in search of wondrous wildlife. There's also some brilliant conservation schemes here. I'll be telling you a little bit about those, and I'll be delving into the culture and history of El Salvador. On my adventures, I'll find out about Salvadoran pumas, cuddle a Sicilian, get close to spider monkeys, these are fabulous looks. Get too close to a croc. Ooh. Help out sea turtle scientists. And get fired up at a fabulous festival. I'm going to make two visits to El Salvador, one in the dry season, one in the wet season. I can't wait to get started. El Salvador is in the north of the Central American Isthmus. It's bordered by Guatemala and Honduras. It's the smallest and most populous nation in Central America. The capital is San Salvador. Founded in 1525, the city lies in the shadow of volcanoes. I'm high on San Salvador Volcano, looking across to the double peak of San Vicente Volcano. During the city's long history, there's been some destructive earthquakes, so today, no colonial buildings remain. The elaborate Metropolitan Cathedral has been rebuilt three times. This version was completed in 1999. Driving out of the city, I pass a symbol that represents El Salvador and Salvadorans throughout the world. This square with the statue, Salvador del Mundo, saver of the world, is one of the most famous landmarks in San Salvador. The monument with a statue of Christ standing on top of planet Earth is 18 meters high. It's April, the dry season, and the fields are thirsty for rain. Most of the lowlands of El Salvador are agricultural. These are sugarcane fields on either side of me, but there are some precious fragments of woodland remaining. One of these forest patches lies close to Volcano Tecapa. Chiguan Tique is a sanctuary for precious primates. I join rangers from the Department of the Environment. They're experts on the daily routine of the monkeys. On the way to meet them, there's a predator that eats spiders. This is a lovely insect to see, a real Central American speciality, a helicopter damselfly. This one uses its flying skills to steal insects from the web. Helicopter damsels usually pick off spiders instead. Although this spider looks a little bit large for a delicate damselfly. <sighs> spiders give their name to the monkeys we're tracking because they look like arachnids when they hang by their tails with their arms and legs dangling. Ahí están los monos. 
Oh yeah, gracias. I can see him. Brilliant, a male. My first spider monkey in El Salvador. At 60 centimetres, he's about the size of a standard poodle. <laughs> this is really lovely. There's a female looking on and two youngsters playing in the treetops. Females produce a baby every two to four years. Twins are rare. Spider monkeys looking like a spider. A furry mass of arms and legs. This is wonderful. A female and a baby moving in the cecropia. <laughs> These are fabulous looks. I love the way they use their tails. They're so strong, they can support the weight of the monkey. Even during a violent tug of war with a vine. Suspended by his tail, this one stuffs his face. Fruits make up 80% of the diet. The whole troop's coming across here. Central American spider monkeys are critically endangered. In El Salvador, protection from hunters and the development of wildlife corridors between forest patches have encouraged a baby boom. <laughs> These spider monkeys have put on a splendid show. It's truly brilliant that they're protected in El Salvador. I leave Chaguantique and drive for an hour or so to El Hocatal a 4,000 hectare reserve at the base of San Miguel volcano. This corner of El Salvador reminds me of the African savanna. Hola. Hi. Hi there. Nice you. Yep. Oh, wow. Oh, which is gracious. A shirt like yours. Qué bueno. This is a great shirt, honorary ranger for the day. The rangers are proud guardians of these grasslands with their magnificent guanacaste trees and the wildlife that lives here. Peretete. <laughs> Peretete! I know what they are. They're a speciality here. <laughs> Double striped thick knees are fabulous birds. Although their name is misleading. It does look like they've got swollen knees, but in fact, those are the ankles. The knees of birds are tucked up under the feathers next to the body. These birds feed on insects, the occasional small lizard and rodent. They're active at night, which is why they've got big yellow eyes, just like owls. Here's a thick knee on a nest. She's probably sitting on a clutch of two eggs. They often lay their eggs in amongst dried cow dung. This one certainly has. It helps camouflage the nest. There's over 50 breeding pairs of double-striped thick knees on this reserve. <laughs> it's the best place in El Salvador to see them. My new friends take me to the edge of a small patch of forest because they know I'm a fan of snakes. The rangers have often seen spectacular venomous snakes here. They're really keen to find one for me. A 
you have to look and listen for these snakes. Hey, gracias, Leo. There it is. The cascavel rattles a warning and flickers its tongue to pick up my scent. It's a big snake. For this one, I'll need my hook at its longest. It's on the move. There we go. These are beautiful snakes. Middle American rattlesnake or cascavel. In Mexico and the US, there's many species of rattlesnakes. But in Central America, this is the only species of rattlesnake that you can find. They can grow to be 1.8 metres. The males grow larger than the females. They use the rattle, of course, to warn big animals like cows. Please don't tread on me. I can defend myself. And predators don't attack me because I've got a very, ooh, very toxic venom. A bite from one of these snakes would be excruciatingly painful. There'd be swelling, blistering, and eventually tissue necrosis. Rattlesnakes have got heat-sensitive pits between their eyes and their nostrils, so they can detect the body heat of their prey and of me. It's a real super sense, so they can detect their prey in pitch darkness. Sadly, in El Salvador and other Central American countries, some people still kill these magnificent reptiles on site, but of course, they will only bite in self-defense if they're severely provoked. And left to their own devices, they do a great job for farmers keeping down populations of rats and mice. I've got to be careful here. I don't want to get within striking range. If you're wondering what a rattlesnake feels like, each of the scales has a tiny kill, so when you stroke them, they're rough to the touch. A gorgeous cascavel or middle American rattlesnake. Let's let him go now. A beautiful creature and one that deserves to be respected and admired. The cascavel, superb. Muchas gracias. El Hocatel is wonderful. Gracias, Thank you. gracias, gracias. Oh, gracias. Yeah. Thank you for letting me be a ranger for a day. Fantastico. <laughs> <laughs> I say goodbye to El Hocatel and bounce along a track in the shadow of San Miguel Volcano. I head northwards parallel to the Pacific. After 90 miles, I turn towards the coast and surf city. El Salvador boasts some of the longest and most perfect waves in Central America. As well as being fun for surfers, the consistent waves provide a plentiful supply of food. The egrets are local diners. The sandlings are on a layover en route to their Arctic nesting grounds. They run like little clockwork toys to see small creatures stirred up by the waves. As well as sandy beaches, the coast of El Salvador has internationally important forests of mangroves, like these at Barra de Santiago. They're home to an animal group older than the dinosaurs. Nigel. Hey. Right. Right. See some crocodillos. Ray Luna is part of a government team looking after them. These mangrove forests are spectacular and are one of the most important habitats on Earth. El Salvador has replanting schemes to recover lost areas of mangrove. They're vital nurseries for fish 
and a coastal defence against hurricanes and storms. Great, right. fantastico. Fantastic. Yeah. Big crocs hunt in these brackish waters. Ray knows the best spots for them. Cocodrilo, cocodrilo. Oh, yes. This is fabulous. It's a pretty impressive male crocodile. Bull American grocs can grow to five meters long. This one is about three meters. They'll hunt fish, amphibians, water birds, any mammals coming to drink. That's a bit too close. With one sweep of that tail, he could be in the boat. This is a fabulous look at a rare reptile here in El Salvador. But the team here are doing their very best to protect the remaining crocs. Fantastic, Ray. Thank you. Gracias. A channel snaking through the mangroves leads to the HQ of the Croc Protection Team. A few nights ago, they had a visitor. Juan Perez shows me where she dug into the sand. This is the nest. There's eggs buried here. I'm used to alligator nests, big mounds of vegetation, but the American crocs lay their eggs in the sand just like marine turtles do. A female croc was caught on camera leaving the river. After excavating a nest chamber, she laid a clutch of between 20 to 60 eggs. Her nest is safe, close to the ranger station, but other nests are at risk. Some locals are so afraid of crocs, they destroy their nests. So when the rangers find them, they move the eggs into this protected hatchery. It takes about 85 days for the eggs to hatch. Juan is a substitute mum. He helps the babies break out from their eggs and digs them out of the sand, just as their mother would do. The mother croc would carefully carry the babies to the river in her mouth. Juan's bucket is the next best thing. Because of the team's hard work, the numbers of American crocs are on the rise. Theirs isn't the only conservation project at Barro de Santiago. Another one benefits noisy acrobats. If the government hadn't taken drastic action, yellow nape parrots would have been lost from the wild in El Salvador. Yeah. Buena suerte. The critically endangered parrots need safe places to lay their eggs and rear their babies. So a team from the Ministry of the Environment and Natural Resources give them nest boxes. These artificial homes are more easily protected from poachers who steal chicks for the pet trade than wild nests. So the parrots have a better chance of breeding successfully. The parrot project is working well. Every year, there's more and more young birds like these. They don't have yellow necks like the adults. The future looks rosy 
for yellow napes here. Most yellow naped parrots live far from volcanoes, so there's little chance their homes will be buried under lava and ash. But in the 7th century AD, that's exactly what happened here. I'm visiting Hoya de Suren, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, 20 miles west of San Salvador, the capital of El Salvador. This remarkable site was discovered in 1976 when a bulldozer driver revealed a mysterious structure made of clay. This special place is the Pompeii of the Americas. Around 1,400 years ago, this Maya village was preserved by a volcanic eruption. As well as houses, a sauna and food stores, there's garden tools, bean-filled pots and sleeping mats. There were no human casualties, but there is the skeleton of a mouse caught in the act of stealing grain. So why is this extraordinary archaeological site enclosed in netting? It's because these ancient ruins were under attack by Torregos, the national bird of El Salvador. Torregos are also known as turquoise-browed motmots. They nest in burrows up to two and a half metres long. The birds had to be kept out of Hoya de Suren before they damaged the precious Maya ruins irreparably. Luckily, these racket-tailed diggers have plenty of alternative nest sites. Although neighbours still squabble over the best burrows. No harm done, barely a feather out of place. Turquoise browed motmots are the national bird because they represent the beauty of nature, liberty and freedom. El Salvador's national tree has the same attributes. Maki Lishwats are the centerpiece of many plazas, flowering from October to April. This one graces the town of Attico. The national tree of El Salvador, Maki Lishwat, is truly superb. Attico is situated high on the slopes of an extinct volcano. The fertile volcanic soil and climate are perfect for a plant that fueled the economy and shaped the history of El Salvador for over a century. The coffee plant. These are freshly picked beans. In the 1920s, coffee accounted for 90% of the country's exports. The trees shading the coffee plants provide cover and food for wildlife. I'm here for creatures that live underground. You get really peculiar creatures living on coffee farms, especially if there's piles of decomposing coffee hulls. They love the rich soil under these piles. It's very good for their prey, earthworms. The workers here have told me they've seen them in this area. They come up to the surface after rain. That's what I'm trying to simulate. Let's see if it worked. There's certainly oh, rich soil underneath. I can feel something. <laughs> There we go, what an oddity, Tepucua, it's called in El Salvador, the other name is Mexican Sicilian. They can grow to be 60 centimetres long, this one's about 45 centimetres. But what kind of creature is this? We all know frogs and toads, newts and salamanders are amphibians. Sicilians are a less well-known amphibian group. Because they spend their lives underground, they have vestigial eyes and detect prey with sensory tentacles on their snouts. They're pretty common here in El Salvador. People sometimes even find them in their gardens. Let's put him back now. 
<laughs> that was fantastic. On this dry season visit, the Tepulkua was my last creature encounter. I left for a few months before coming back to the land of the volcanoes in August, during the wet season. I've returned to El Salvador for wildlife events that only happen during the rainy season. But first of all, I'm going to an extraordinary festival that commemorates a volcanic eruption. The volcano blew its top in 1658. You can still see the fields of lava near the town of Nahapa. The people believe the massive eruption was the result of a fight between the local patron Saint Geronimo and the devil. This battle is celebrated on August the 31st every year in the Festival of Fire. I've come to Nahapa to witness it. This is great, the excitement's building. Time to taste the national dish of El Salvador, a pupusa. Eaten for breakfast or dinner, these corn dough delicacies can have a variety of fillings. Muchas gracias. Hooray! Vegetarian pupusas are delicious. Corn and cheese, wonderful. As two teams with painted faces gather at opposite ends of the town, there's fireworks literally in the street. <laughs> this surefire spectacle has no set rules. This is crazy. These guys are mad. I'm so glad I'm just a spectator. So I thought about it. And hey, win in El Salvador. Do what the Salvadorians do. Way! The two teams fling flaming balls of cloth that have been marinated in kerosene for weeks. Our only protection, cotton clothes and gardening gloves soaked in water. Have your wits about you. There's balls of fire coming in the air along the ground. It's all good natured fun, although I think it's time for an honourable retreat. I was on fire three times tonight. In just two hours, the teams threw over 4,000 fireballs. <laughs> the next day, I meet my friend, Director of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, Miguel Gallardo. He wants to show me a magical place in the northeast of his country. We're high on the slopes of an extinct volcano. Why is this such a special place? Well, this is the first Puma reserve in El Salvador. The reserve protects 120 hectares of isolated forest. For the feline project, the Department of the Environment has a team of seven rangers based here. As well as deterring poachers and preventing illegal logging, they monitor the forest for any evidence of pumas. The remains of a kill. A puma has eaten an agouti, a guinea pig-like rodent. 
The team use camera traps to find out if the pumas are resident in El Salvador or just passing through. So Nigel, in this part of the forest, we have a lot of puma activity. In this trail, we have cameras 13 and 14 that have captured some of the most amazing puma behavior. In fact, just yesterday, there was a puma standing right here. That's exciting. We're in the paw prints of a puma. The cameras recorded a male puma marking his territory with scent glands on his cheeks. The camera trap showed there was plenty of prey for the cats to hunt. These are Central American agoutis. This is a white-tailed deer. Then they recorded evidence of breeding. A mother with a young cub still with spots. The team recorded the baby growing up. This is really exciting. Proof positive there's a resident group of Salvadoran pumas. There's at least one breeding pair and their cubs. 80. Education is important too. The rangers share the news of the pumas with the local people and tell them a little bit about their natural history. This family are proud to have the cats on their doorstep. Hopefully, there'll be pumas living here for many generations to come. I leave El Salvador's first puma reserve and travel north. Close to the town of Suchi Toto, I take to the water and cross Suchi Tlung Lake. This glorious ferry ride is a shortcut to my next destination, the highest mountain in El Salvador. The peak of El Patal is over 2,700 metres high. Right on the border with Honduras, it's home for some very special creatures. To encounter some of them, I follow a winding mountain track along the flank of El Patal. I reach La Babuja, an eco-lodge surrounded by a forest of magnificent pines. As well as outstanding views, La Babuja is a top spot for mountain hummingbirds. They're attracted by the flowers and sugar water feeders. You can get up to 10 species of hummer here a young male Rivoli's hummingbird. These hummers must watch their backs. A Mexican violet ear rules the roost here, raising feathery purple ear tufts when enraged. The last hummer hovering. A glorious white-eared hummingbird. This is a little male. You wouldn't expect reptiles in these cool mountain forests, but they're certainly here. I'm looking for a timbo. Snake, look, 
at this, it's a real special here. A beautiful Montane Pit Viper or Timbo. This is a young one. They can grow to 75 centimetres or so. They're found at altitudes of up to 1,800 metres. It's so cool at that altitude, they can't breed every year. So it's one of the few tropical snakes to breed every other year. They have a litter of two to eight babies. The mother acts like a moving incubator. She shuttles backwards and forwards into the sun, warming the eggs that she's retained inside her and then gives birth when the babies are fully formed. They're miniature replicas of the adults. You can tell this is a pit viper because of the heat-seeking pit between the eye and the nostril. I'm being careful because they've got quite a toxic venom. Although this one is so calm, he hasn't tried to strike at me once. This is a gorgeous snake. I'm sorry to have disturbed your sunbathing. I leave the Montane Pit Viper basking and climb higher up the mountain. El Patel Lodge is situated at 2,600 metres. Biologist Will Marino hopes we can find the charming amphibian he studies here. The cloud forest is his office and he notices any organisms that are out of the ordinary here. Look at that, Nigel. <sighs> wow. Will's made a truly extraordinary find. As far as he knows, this fungus has never been seen in El Salvador before. It's called the anemone stinkhorn. Looks like a sea anemone, and if you get really close... Oh, dear me! It absolutely stinks. A mix of putrefying flesh and sick. That attracts insects. When they walk on the fungus, they get covered in spores, fly away and disperse them. I can't bear that smell for much longer. This is a really crazy fungus. The anemone stinkhorn, a native of Australia, is spreading around the world in garden products or soil. This is the first time it's been recorded in El Salvador. The fungus is a new addition to life in these forests of clouds. The critically endangered creatures that Will studies if high up on the trees. So the best way to see them is to climb. We're ascending to reach a band of epiphytes, the plants that festoon trees in the cloud forest. These include bromeliads. Their rosettes of stiff leaves make secure, moist retreats for amphibians. Well, I've got one. There's an El Patal salamander hiding in here. Uh -huh. This is the species that Will is studying. They're critically endangered. They're only found on the mountain of El Patal, which straddles the border between Honduras and El Salvador. Because of habitat destruction and climate change, their numbers are dwindling. This one is probably a male. He's about six centimetres long. Females grow a little larger, up to 10 centimetres. They feed on small insects and spiders. They've got a long, sticky tongue for catching their prey. They sometimes come to the ground, but they spend most of their lives in these bromeliads. Which is grassy as well. It was so great laying eyes on them. It's a pleasure to show you, Nigel. Thank you. I'm dropping down to sea level next. I've enjoyed my adventures above the clouds on the mountain of El Patal. 
But now I must leave for the mangroves of Hickeylisco Bay to meet a giant. I join a team of conservationists from Pro Costa who are setting a trap. Under the water, there's a meadow of seagrass, which they encircle with the net. If the floats at the top of the net start to wiggle, we'll know a giant is trying to break through. There's one here. Yeah. Trap spring strong. The net is holding firm. Now it's down to us. Hey! Well done! <laughs> so strong! <laughs> the black sea turtle has been grazing on seagrass. OK, into the boat! She's heavy! <laughs> I'll soon find out exactly how heavy. She's part of a research project now. Beautiful. <laughs> Good. Melissa, Sophia, here's the turtle I helped catch. Thank you. Gracias. She's beautiful, isn't she? Absolutely Very beautiful. beautiful. Thank you. Covering her eyes with a damp cloth calms her down while her carapace is measured. 78.6. The shells of these turtles can be 1.7 metres long and 90 centimetres across. The team take the vital statistics of this beautiful turtle. Since 2014, Pro Costa have measured and tagged over 400 black sea turtles. She's very relaxed, isn't she? But yeah. this keeps her cool. Turtles tagged in Ecuador and Costa Rica have been found here. So what will she tip the scales at? Let me help with this bit. <laughs> that good? And then I've got a lifter on my shoulder. Whoa! How much does she weigh, Melissa? 102 pounds. Crikey, 47 kilos. Yes. She's a big girl. Very big. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. The black sea turtle, it's only the second time I've seen this species. It's a form of green turtle, unique to the Pacific. And away she goes to feed on seagrass. Black sea turtles mainly come here to feed. Another kind of sea turtle comes here to breed. This is lovely, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> I just couldn't leave Hickelisco Bay and Pro Costa without seeing an even rarer species of turtle. These baby hawksbills on their way for their first swim in the sea. Terrific seeing them scurrying to the sea. Because of Pro Costa's work, there's big numbers of hawksbills yes. now. Yes. Actually, El Salvador has the biggest population of nesting hawksbill in the Pacific area. About 300 hawksbills nest here every year. Pro Costa work with the local fishermen to protect the turtles. When these babies return to nest as mature adults in 20 years, they'll find a safe haven in El Salvador. In the open ocean further north, there are other leviathans.
this reef of lava was formed when Santa Ana erupted 12,000 years ago. It extends out from the fishing village of Los Cobanos into deep Pacific waters. I'm here with Melvin Castaneda, a marine mammal expert. We're looking for humpback whales. Melvin estimates at about 100 visit Los Cobanos between December and March. The females migrate to these warm waters from California and Oregon to give birth. As well as mothers and calves, there's also males hoping for a chance to mate. Individual whales are identified and recorded by Melvin. The patterns on their flukes are as unique as a fingerprint. So far, he's counted 163 different humpbacks here. <laughs> Fantastic! <laughs> Los Cobanos is a brilliant place for whale watching. Volcanoes on the skyline, in the waters off the El Salvador coast, you can see up to 23 species of whale and dolphin. I leave the picturesque village of Los Cobanos for my final adventure in the heart of a volcano. The water-filled crater of Ilopango is the second largest lake in El Salvador. Fernando Lopez, the environment minister, will show me around. Fernando, you've been diving since you were a boy. This is very special, isn't it? It is. It's uh, one of the few places in the world when you can actually dive in an active volcano. Thank you so much for taking me down. Oh, thank you for coming. The lake is full of fish. These are the fry of jaguar cichlids. There's an adult in this cave. Some of the cichlids are confident and confiding. Convict cichlids are the most abundant fish here. They gather in the warm water around the volcanic vents. Twenty metres down, things start to hot up. There's molten magma just beneath these cracks and fissures, heating the water to the temperature of a warm bath. A great experience for Fernando and I. dive. I started the film on the cone of an active volcano. At the end, I'm in the crater of another one. I've loved every minute of my time in El Salvador. The wildlife is wonderful. The Salvadorans are fun and friendly. If you get the chance, you should come and visit for yourself. <laughs>